Hello, everyone, and welcome to WePast's free webinar series. My name is Christina Ruiz, and I will be your moderator this evening. Periodically throughout the webinar, we will stop the presentation to review. There will be poll questions that will appear on the left-hand side of the webinar window. Go ahead and answer these questions as they come up. You will have about 20 seconds to answer each one. We encourage you to use the chat window and ask questions about tonight's topic. The presenter will answer your questions throughout the webinar. Take a moment to choose a resolution using the gear icon in the lower right-hand corner for the best image. This and other recorded webinars will be available to WePass subscribers. Register through WePass.com to become a subscriber. Tonight's topic is Medical Dosimetry Treatment Preparation, presented by Marissa Sheehan, CMD. Marissa has taught at several institutions, including the University of Michigan, Henry Ford Hospital, Grand Valley State University, and Medical Management Technology Institute. Thank you for joining us, Marissa. Hi, my name is Marisa Sheehan, and I'm glad you came to listen tonight. If you were here last week, I do apologize for the technical problems, and hopefully tonight will come off a lot better. I've been a dosimetrist since 1979, seen a bunch of stuff, but let's just talk about what we're here to talk about tonight. And that's preparing for simulation, what a simulator is, what virtual simulation is. It's really important that we make the distinction what the processes are used during simulation, how we acquire data, what we do with MRI and PET data, documentation, and then we are going to get to verification simulation after. So prepping for SIM I think is real important. You're in this great position. You're in the middle of the cancer treatment process. You're not the beginning or the end. You have a great gate warden duty. I have to stress here that while you're at tumor board, while you're in conferences, while you're discussing consults, it's up to you to think about previous treatment, fertility, implanted electronics, signal, single organs like kidneys or eyes, pelvic kidney, COPD and emphysema. You really do need to read all the nurse's notes to consider autoimmune dysfunctions like lupus, MS, Crohn's, and sarcoidosis some really simple things like allergies to tape and contrast. There are, generally speaking, three treatment options in any combination, and including up to no treatment. Timing and sequence, all these things are relevant. The basics are histologic grade and staging. You probably know a great deal about that. The grade includes the differentiation and the proliferative rate and the TNM staging that you're going to have to memorize for your boards. And this is just an example of the esophagus one. It has a lot to do with the penetration of the disease and its size. Typically, the T has to do with penetration into tissues. Whether or not you're treating primary or gross disease, the very place where the tumor most likely started, or you're treating subclinical disease after it's been resected, and whether or not you're treating pre or post operatively. The margin status has a great deal to do with how you're planning your therapy. You're going to want to know if sentinel nodes are positive, for instance, like in breast cancer, it may warrant treatment to the supraclavs or the axillary or internal mam nodes. The timing of radiation therapy. You know that squamous cell carcinomas have a faster cell cycling time and they probably you shouldn't delay getting the radiation going. These are the people that if you can contribute to the speeding up of getting them starting, that's great. Adenocarcinomas like breast and prostate have a slower time. They can either be given chemo first or hormones first. Before you think about simulating, you need to kind of think about what are you going to do? How are you going to approach this? You want to think about these things as you're setting up your sim processes with your therapist or in advance of the patient getting on the couch. One of the things you want to know is um, what kind of energy are you going to use? How are you going to present the patient for um, setup? 
whether or not you're going to use bolus during the treatment, whether or not you're going to need to use, I don't know, vaginal dilator, or if you're going to need to use contrast. All these things need to be thought Simulation consists of pretty much these six basic parts, according to me. And of these, I think that education and safety are in the right spot. They're very important, and you need to consider them. And then comes immobilization, positioning, and the contrast media, and finally the tumor localization. Then you'll see there's documentation after. Is a resource for patients and caregivers. That's a really good one. But the other um, resources you have are disease site specific brochures. They're in multiple languages. You want to educate the patient on what to expect. But I happen to really like that astro video. Most people have cancer journey notebooks. The basic elements are name, medical record number, and date of birth. You want to verify all of that. But also the phone number that they like to be called at, the face photo. You're going to want to go through the SIM order and verify that it's clear to you and that you have a good consent for the procedure, including the tattoos, the contrast, the immobilization. I'm going to forward to the next slide. I ask you to consider the Q&A section of the Google Hangouts for the first polling question. And now we're going to move along, move along to positioning and immobilization. The important considerations that I, I want you to remember is that it would minimum, won't attenuate the beam, that it doesn't have a lot of metal to cause a bunch of artifacts, that the secondary scatter to the skin is, is not too bad, that it allows for visibility of the patient and of the marks and of the area to be treated, that it's light and weight, strong, durable, you can put marks on it, and also, let's get real, it needs to be able to be washed. Your primary goals that I want you to think about when immobilizing and positioning a patient is not only their comfort, but the reproduction of the setup itself. So these are um, components that you're going to often see use, wing boards, slant boards, and all of these contribute to dose escalation eventually, or to at least reducing margins and increasing sparing of organs. There's many different immobilization devices. Um, You've seen a lot of them, and I think that I'm just here and not really a great deal that we have to talk about. But keep in mind that when you are looking at immobilization devices, you want to consider what is comfortable, what is going to be accurate and reproducible positioned, and then the other consideration, tenuing the beam, keeping the um, part visible at least part way. These are all different examples. And they don't have to be complicated. I've seen as simple as uh, rubber bands around feet. All right, we're going to um, stop now for polling question number two. Now moving on to some challenges that you're going to have. There's always challenges of whether or not you're going to treat and sim with arms up versus arms down. Extremities are always a challenge. They're very difficult to immobilize consistently. Trismus is a stiffening of muscles where you're going to um, not be able to get your arm up after breast surgery. Holes right where you don't want them like fistulas or gallbladder T-tubes. Um, Tumor is only accessible from one direction. There's chin obstruction. There's all kinds of problems with surface targets and long targets. So this element of radiation therapy is very serious. And you want them comfortable, easy to produce, and in a practical position. But what's really realistic? You have weight loss or gain problems. You have abdomen um, distension problems. There's problems um, with infusion during treatment where people get swollen. Many times new positioning and simulation and recalculation are all necessary. Are all necessary. These account 
there's also spatial uncertainties that are mechanical like laser alignment and beam angle indicators all of these things can have um, consideration for people and what you expect I want to refer you to TG40 and you should really get your hands on the task group reports that you're going to need for boards and to actually practice and do dosimetry and this is their statement about what they think about simulation you need to know the Linux limitations you should be appropriately immobilize you I love that they um, point out the ease of daily setup and reproducibility. You want to have good recording of all the parameters that were simulated. You need to understand your treatment delivery system limitations. There's going to be problems with extremities when you have couch lateral limitations or you need to know how much of the couch can even be in the beam. When you're going to treat multiple treatment sites, how much range you're going to have in and out of the couch. You're going to want to have a good understanding of the entry patient interference. Certainly there are some warning systems built into treatment machines and even treatment planning machines, but you're going to want to always do verification simulation when there's a doubt about collision interference. You're going to want to check that before you have the patient. Uh, before we go on to no, I think we're going to go ahead with this. We're going to discuss the contrast media typically used. There's iodinated and non-iodinated CT. MRI utilizes gadolinium primarily, or almost all of it. And PET uses FDG. It's not really contrast media, but we're going to use that term right now. At this point, I'd like you to consider the QA section and answer polling question number three, please. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to target localization. This is just a definition. It's the localization of the target volume for the treatment planning, and it should include all information about the person, about the patient, about the whole patient. And localization should be obtained under conditions similar to those that you're going to treat. What are some devices that are used? Back in the days when dinosaurs roamed, we had fluoroscopy, now we have CT. We also use MRI, ultrasound, PET scanners, and uh, fiducial markers are your primary devices that you use. The easiest, which is fiducial, mar fiducial markers, to illustrate here. There's lots of them. They're used in different ways. They're implanted different ways. Most typically, you're going to see gold seeds and prostates, but there's used for SBRT and other markers are used other what are some goals for placing the isocenter? I think the number one goal is treatment consistency and beam geometry benefits and effects and then image guided radiation therapy perspectives too. The center of the target versus the best repositioning. The center of the target if you're only going to use one treatment, that's a good consideration. The best repositioning at all other times. Stable skin marking places. Um, if an isocenter can go there, that's terrific. Immobilization device marking. How far is too far away when you're marking a device versus where you're going to end up treating? And including, always including the marking plane in the image data. This does come into play with extremities. So we're going to talk a little bit about isocenter positioning. And I want to make the distinction right now between isocenter versus normalization point. In treatment planning, we can normalize the dose just about anywhere within the treated area. The isocenter is where everything is rotating about in the linear accelerator room. And it should be in the patient. That's always a good idea. You shouldn't be rotating the gantry about a point outside the patient. But where's the most consistent beam setup? What are portal imaging limitations off-centering off portal imagers? You want to avoid tangent surfaces and the tangent tabletop. And I, like I said before, keeping the isocenter within the treated volume. I put an illustration of an ear on there because that's one of the most difficult places to mark, to get an SSD on, to find the surface of in a data set. It's, it's a piece of uh, work getting something done near an ear. You have to think carefully about where you put the isocenter. When an extremity is really angled, how should the isocenter be placed to take advantage of beam geometry? If a position 
if uh, something's close to the surface, you want to consider having a surface isocenter, right? 100 SSD treatment. You want to consider uh, a great big drop off, like in the super clab, how the skin drops off very suddenly from being something like 8, 9, 10 centimeters thick to being 2 centimeters thick at the top of the shoulder. These are all considerations that you have. So we need to talk about the data set orientation and we're going to talk about it without laser position data transfer first. So many people have lap systems. That's not the example that we're talking about right now. We're talking about the use of BBs or other metal marking systems. The laser system is independent to the image set. You set up a marking plane and you mark it. You fix the surface markers to it and then you image it. The dosimetrist will define the marking plane in treatment planning and the isocenter of the plan will be translated from that at some point. So this is what's commonly called a shift method. The patient's marks are placed on the patient prior to the scan. You put them in a good spot. You put them on the sternum or you put them on some bones or you put them where your therapists are used to looking at them. And during the treatment planning, you make shifts from those marks that are either recorded by the treatment planning system or recorded by you or somehow communicated to the treatment room. And then those are applied prior to the patient treatment and the patient is then remarked. But then there is a no shift method. And the no shift method, you acquire a scan and the doctor's typically there and you review the slices and you decide where you want the isocenter right then. And you program that into movable lasers and they, um, move to that position and you can mark the patient accordingly. The determination of the off-center can be performed by the SIM staff or by the doctor, but it's a common misconception that tumor localization is intended to be used by a physician. It's primarily used by therapists and they're trained to place isocenters in an optimal position. Most of the time they're right. Physicians are typically only involved in isocenter placement for really complicated cases. So we're going to talk a little bit about the equipment. There's a conventional simulator, which is film, fluoroscopy, and um, digital imaging systems. And then there's CT simulation systems that include localization la lasers and software features. So these are examples of uh, different simulators. So there's, a, I think, an old Zimatron up there in the upper left-hand corner. Those are digitally... Um, digital images that would have come across like in Soma Vision or something like that. There's a CT simulator in the bottom left hand corner and it's screen data. Simulation includes documentation whether it be electronic or paper and you have documentation of the tattoos and the skin markings themselves are documents and photographs of them. The patient set up description everything you used underneath or with or for them the charting of the procedure, what you actually did to the person, and the recording and verifying of things like uh, the couch parameters. You want to label all the immobilization devices. You're going to put down any caliper or ruler measurements. Yes, they're still used. And I think we'll take now time for polling question number four in the QA section. Next thing we're going to discuss is the simulation skin markers and you see that those are all metal markers there in the middle and then those are tattoo covers there on the bottom. Now let's talk a little bit about where to mark on the patient if you had your choices. And I think you should generally use the parietal temporal midline portions of the body to mark on when you can. You can mark on the mandible but it should be in the very front and the very middle, not necessarily on the jaw itself on the sides. The ribs and sternum make very stable points. The trochanters and the pubis are a decent place to mark and the long axis of extremities are also good places to mark. You want to avoid all breasts, male and female. The abdomen inferior to the xiphoid. Anywhere on a big abdominal or pelvic paniculus or within skin folds. The mouth and eyes are bad places to mark. The clavicles, the scapula, ankles and wrists, they all rotate. Anything with mobility or independence of the trunk 
should be avoided if you can possibly avoid it. Sometimes it cannot be avoided. We're going to take time right now for polling question number five. All right, now we're going to proceed with tattoos. They can be given at the initial SIM or at the verification SIM when you bring the patient back to check the plan. They increase the reproducibility of treatment fields. And there's, um, a there's the distinction. When you tattoo at the initial CT SIM, then you're probably going to translate daily. You're going to level the patient to their tattoos. And it is possible that you can um, have a treatment misplacement because some could treat on the tattoos rather than do the translation. There's that chance. You can tattoo at the verification sim, and that way you're only translating the one time. So as you're getting your initial verification sim images approved, you can um, then you have zero chance for treatment misplacement from then on. But you could have had a possible data set interpretation error. Nothing is error proof. And there's my joke. Just sad, but good. Treatment simulation can be done, as we said, with a conventional simulator or a target driven simulation with CT or MR and virtual simulation. So we're going to make that distinction again that virtual simulation is done on the treatment planning station most of the time. Conventional simulation includes a floral machine or even a CT machine. So this was a nice little article about um, KV, regular um, fluoroscopic simulators. And the only reason I included it is in case you have your chance to get a, your hands on it. Um, on the slides later, you could study it in more detail. It just says that mostly they're non-existent in the United Kingdom and in North America, that CT simulators have pretty much taken over. So we'll talk a little bit about conventional simulators because you have such little opportunity to be exposed to them. So they would floral for gantry angles, floral to help um, with positioning. You'd floral to localize where you were going to go. The typical brands, if you want to look them up, are the Odelft and the Varian Zimitron and the Kermath and even a Toshiba had one. All of these images, if you can look at the picture of the model on the table, you can see that the image intensifier has the ability to go in and out also. So magnification factors would have to be calculated on all images that were acquired with film or even um, all digital images are typically recalibrated back to 100, but if you had film actually on top of that image processor, then you'd have to do magnification calculations on it. I think we're going to take time now for polling question number six, please. Right, returning to conventional simulation, you see the basic setup of how the couch is, you know, meant to mimic a treatment couch. The anatomy is easily viewed. You can see people swallowing, things like that. Um, many times you could plan blocks. Do you see that there's a block tray on that simulator? That would be um, another thing that could be done on a fluoroscopic type of conventional simulator. So this is an example of... Um, images that might have been obtained from a conventional simulator and blocks are drawn on films and mag factors are calculated and I have to tell you at this point that you must consider the fact that any contours have to be obtained physically if you need a contour of the body surface or if you need off-axis data or separations things like that you need um, thicknesses 
variable variations in the surface, anything that you're going to use in a 2D calc, you need to acquire that off of the patient while you have them on the couch. There's no going back to the data later because this is all the data you have. So typically you'd have to calculate the couch angles <clears throat> in order to have a field match between, for instance, the supraclavicular and the tangent breast, if that's the way you were doing it. And this is just a table, and it's so old that you can see that there's ADSSD um, information on here, which would have been pertinent to call. But you will be asked at the time of your boards how to calculate this. It's still used for medulloblastoma and some other things. So matching adjacent fields with the inverse tangent calculation is as illustrated. Now we'll talk about CT simulation. I think you are a great deal more familiar with that. Typically, there's fiducial marking. Um, you might even mark out field borders or surgical scars. The patient position, um, you're going to want to have that well documented or established by routine. And uh, one thing to note is that smaller slices give the best DRRs. Typically, you're going to want to keep to 3 millimeters and under for slice thickness. We're going to talk about the field of view, which is called FOV. So you want to manipulate the field of view to maximize your resolution. You want it to include the entire body surface because you really do need that for treatment planning, but you don't need to have it set out to 40 by 40 if all you're going to shoot is just the head. You should know that the field of view has an edge artifact, so if something is very close to the edge, you're going to see a blurring and a tangential effect of the beam coming across the tangent edge. Pinnacle sends, um, accepts an image data cube, like that black square that you see, and Eclipse is an uh, image data cylinder. The center, XYZ, 000, is the center of the data set. So my big statement here is that when you have a 3D data set, you can reconstruct things, and that just shows the brain stem and the cord. You, you can't do that with fluoroscopic images and um, two-dimensional imaging. Which brings us to the point of polling question number seven, please. All right. I have several slides now from Washington University in St. Louis, and um, they just had nicely defined concepts. So this is just the definition of treatment planning as a whole. I don't think it's a big lightning bolt, but you have CT volumes and internal organs at risk, and you design the beam shapes and the beam orientations, and then you calculate them, and then you plan and treatment for verification. You put them back on the couch and, and reassess whether or not that's right. So their first step was patient immobilization. And this is just a definition of what they said patient immobilization was. And then they said that the physician defines the anatomic boundaries of the CT scan. Sometimes this is done with an order. Sometimes this is done with um, the physician actually there and with and without IV contrast. So they would consider the step two is how to figure out where the target is. Once the CT data set's been acquired, now it's transferred to a computer. So this tumor target volume delineation would be called virtual simulation at this point. So I'm trying to make a distinction between the actual sim, the acquiring of the data, the virtual simulation, which is where it's done on the treatment planning machine. At this point, a uh, doctor is going to input in a GTV and a CTV. This should always be the doctor's realm. Uh, they can prescribe planning target volume margins. And whether or not you're the one that does the um, regions of interest of organs at risk, that's, all, that's up to individual practice. Next thing we want to talk about after we have a bunch of structures is where we're going to put the isocenter. And you can, this exam, this uh, particular definition says near the center of the CTV, but I have to tell you that that doesn't always work. There is <clears throat> sensible places to put isocenters, depending upon whether you're going to beam split or how you're going to use air interfaces to your advantage or disadvantage. 
then there's also reference points that you're going to um, end up referring to on the surface of the patient. And I want to also point out that there's also dose reference points too. So be careful about that term reference point. Reference point on the skin or a mobilization device or a reference point for dose calculation also. These shifts are um, wherever you end up shifting the isocenter two has to be communicated to the treatment room so that there can be a verification to them. So we're going to go over this again. You have an actual simulation, a physical simulation done with a CT simulator most likely. You have a virtual simulation that's done on the treatment planning machine. And then you have a verification simulation that's done on the linear accelerator table on the patient. So this is just continues on with their definition about uh, defining structures on a slice by slice basis. So these are some of the advantages that they discussed, which I thought were um, interesting. Virtual simulation, they mention it here. That's the part that you do on the treatment planning computer. And it allows for um, a lot of variation. You can try a million times. There's nobody waiting to go to the bathroom or anything like that. It's very convenient for the patient. It saves them from further fatigue. And then um, you can always go back to it and get data off of it. Another advantage is um, the display of the target volumes and you get to have this little view, a 3D view of how things look. So I'd like to ask you what happens after the CT sim? You transfer the data to the treatment planning system. You do all this contouring. You do the computer planning and it can be quasi 2D. Really if you have a CT scan it's 2.5D at lowest. You can do a, a central axis dose calculation, but it's still involving all the scatter from the off-axis plane, so it's really not 2D. You can use your forward where you decide how much weight each beam has and how much dose goes to each beam, or inverse where the computer uses an algorithm to determine how much dose goes to each beam. There's dose computations that's done, and then plan evaluation. So. Virtual simulation, sometimes called the sim after the sim, uses the CT sim data to reconstruct the patient virtually within the treatment planning system. So you see several reconstructions there illustrated, and you just have at it. But that doesn't mean that it's uh, a sloppy situation. You have to be very accurate. You have to be mindful of what's going to happen in the treatment room with these beam angles and geometries that you're dreaming up in treatment. So this again gives advantages of the CT scanner and the virtual simulation is the process performed with the data collected from the CT scan. The software is capable of producing DRRs and the radiation oncologist can define volumes or they can draw on the DRRs, they can do whatever they want virtual, in this virtual environment. Here's um, Washington U's definition basically the same thing. They also talk about the beam's eye view display which sometimes shows you um, the direction you're looking on the screen as if you were the beam source yourself and many times you can see light shadowing over the patient or you can see what things interfere with the beam. That's uh, another advantage of treatment planning systems when they have surfaces to deal with. This illustrates more advantages faster, better soft tissue, you get density information collected for heterogeneity calculations that cannot be done in a true 2D calculation. It increases precision for organ definition and tumor localization. There's um, the 3D data collected that gives a good view and typically more complex planning can be done. So we're going to talk a little bit about data sets. It's very important that you realize that the CT sim is the parent or primary or principal data set. We're going to come back to that, so you're going to want to remember it. Fused data sets like MRs and PETs are subjected to or lay beneath or behind the parent. They seem to overlay them on the screen, but you actually don't calculate on them. The only MRs that are calculated on are CyberKnife, and they don't use heterogeneity calculations for CyberKnife treatments. 
So I just want you to remember that the CTSIM is the parent. That's the principal data set. That's the, the thing that all the other treatments and motions and translations and everything will be relative to. <clears throat> Here's some data set terms. So for the CT, you're going to want to know what a field of view is, the Hounsfield units, slice thickness, what a partial volume artifact is. And then the MR, you're going to want to be able to distinguish between T1, T2, and T2 flare for sure. For PET, you're going to want to understand standard uptake value and attenuated corrected and non-attenuated corrected and what filtered back projection means and what FTG is. So let's go to CT. We already talked about the field of view. So the Hounsfield units are um, the scale and it has a mean attenuation. That's a little bit different than electron density, but we relate the two together. And in Hounsfield, you go from a positive 3,071, 3, which is most attenuating and be a very dense metal, to a negative 1,024, which is the least attenuating. So water has an attenuation of zero. It's kind of normalized to zero. And air is negative 1,000, so I'm sorry that that negative sign is on the right side of the slide and the 1,000 is over there on the left. Bone is around positive 400. Cranial bone can get even more dense. And it's interesting that titanium is actually less dense than some bone, but not much. Metal implants are usually in the very high numbers, 2 and 3,000. Slice thickness we talked about before, 3 millimeter, 1.25, 1.5. You're going to want to know what you're dealing with before it gets to the treatment planning system, but you should be able to distinguish what the slice thickness was as you scroll from slice to slice and the uh, Z position changes on the screen. Let's talk about partial volume effects. So each pixel is the attenu attenuation properties of a specific material in volume, a voxel. If that volume is compromised um, by having it's being adjacent to things of different densities, this is termed partial volume effect. The resolution, all the material boundaries are blurred to some extent, and one voxel can affect the CT values of the surrounding voxels. It's not easy to interpret, and, uh, and it's an opportunity to extract fine scale data. You, you can't really get that from CT images. There is a limit. The contrast agents, we had talked about it, the oral gastrographins and the injected uh, iodinated base. The MRI data set terms that I think I'd like you to um, understand listed above there are the um, benefits of MRI. And that is with the soft tissueing. You, it just can't be beat. And T1 weighted scans are the standard basic scan. Typically, it's the first one that they run. It differentiates fat from water. Water is dark and fat is, is whiter. It's run very fast. Typically, it's what they run first, almost like a scout scan. T2, the fat is a little darker and the water is lighter. And they're particularly well suited to imaging edema. On brain scans, the cerebral white matter, it has some fat. And it's uh, darker. And the... Uh, gray matter is just a bit brighter. T2 weighted spans use a spinnaco sequence and they've long been the clinical workhorse. It's less susceptible to inhomogeneities in the magnetic field and that matters a lot in MR. Not necessarily inhomogeneities inside the patient but whatever is inside the magnetic field itself in the room. All the uh, body coils and things that they put around it. The T2 flare, and flare stands for fluid attenuation inversion recovery. Now you're going to see a lot of words, fiesta, flare, there's all kinds of words that they use for this. And uh, I, my example is that it's used in brain imaging to su suppress the signal of cerebral spinal fluid, and I'll give you some examples. And gadolinium is the contrast media typically used. And these are examples of a T1 where the fluid is dark and the fat would be bright. That's with GAD, so the gadolinium enhancement. That's a spine. Fat is light. And a neck. T1 oral cavity in there, you can't see much fat at all. There's a T2 brain. Now the fat is dark. 
darker. This is a T2 brain with flare. So on the left is a regular T2 brain, and on the right is the exact same image with fluid level attenuation. So this is a comparison between T1, T2, and flare, and I think that's a good one for you to keep in mind. I would go on the internet and find this image if I were you. Here's a distinction between T2 and T2 flare, and you see the suppression of the cerebral spinal cord. So let's move along to PET data sets. So there's a lot of processing of PET data. You just can't grab them right off the screen and there's a lot of calculation that's done. It corrects for random coincidence. It has a subtraction of the scattered photons. There's a detector dead time um, and detector sensitivity correction. There's a lot of calculations that go on with the data that's acquired during a PET scan. So let's talk about filtered back projection. It reconstructs images from the projections and it, it's simple and it doesn't use a lot of computing resources, but it, there's a lot of noise in the data. I, not, I don't know much about iterative expectation maximization algorithms, but this is the, the word for the new calculations that are being done and it has a better noise profile and resistance to streak artifacts. So here's attenuation cor correction. You take a CT just prior to the PET acquisition, and that attenuation that was received, all that data from the CT, is plugged into the PET machine so that you can use the fact that you know the attenuation all the way across the slice in order to make the calculations of the PET images. Before you'd have um, really big objects would have um, the wrong results deep in the body. They'd have really low FDG uptake. You wouldn't see anything in the middle of large objects. But now because we have a CT, that's what's taken. That's why we do PET CTs together. So SUVs are standardized uptake values and they're a measure of the concentration of the radio tracer. And this is examples of attenuated corrected versus non-attenuated corrected. And you can see, you know, I didn't monkey with these images. They're just fuzzier with the non-attenuation corrected. And you can see that they're darker in the middle. This just shows you what happens when you put the hot iron color selection on. There's all kinds of colors you can use. This is um, the CT of the neck, and it shows the CT and the PET fused up together. This is the way they were taken together. This is a uh, pet fusion after the fact, I believe. Although I'm not, yes, I think it was. Uh, this is already fused on treatment. This shows a pet MRI fusion. We need to talk a little bit about file transfer protocols, and then we're going to get into the fusions. The file transfer protocols, um, like FTP, there's also hypertext and real time. That's what those symbols mean. Um, DICOM stands for Digital Imaging and Communication in Medicine, and that's a standard, and it's been changed several times, but it is a standard in imaging. And the abbreviations that you're going to see are CT, MR, PT, and US. Those are the ones you pretty, pretty much are going to see in your treatment planning environment. DICOM groups of info cannot be split up, and it restricts the file names to eight characters and the uh, Space the each slice should be 512 by 512 by 16. You need to know that 4.19 megabytes. And about 200 images is roughly a gig. There are some uh, pitfalls in fire file transfer protocol. Transfer speed is kind of hard, and non-synchronized system clocks are still a problem. You need to watch out for that if you have an old computer that has a non-functioning clock. Most times it's not the case. So now we're going to talk a tiny bit about treatment planning system. And one of the things that I want to bring up is that there's orientation tools within the treatment planning system. So there's things that are going to tell you what's superior, what's inferior, what's left, right, ant, and post. So there's anatomic plane icons and um, the data set file orientation definitions are in there. Plan treatment planning systems have, and you've seen, I think, the pinnacle cube that has the A and the P and the S and the I. And... Um, 
then Eclipse has that little CAD plan man that looks like Michelin tire sales guy. Fusion tools are also included in treatment planning systems. Mutual information algorithms mostly, or reference point systems, manual systems. There are some treatment planning systems that have deformable, but we'll get into that. But deformable registration is just another fusion tool. It's another type. What do you use when you want to fuse data sets? You want to use eyeballs, ventricles, arteries, teeth, spinal bodies are very good, the mandible. You want to use the sternum, the spine, again bones, the heart ventricle, and I'll show you an example of that. And in the abdomen and pelvis, you want to use the pubic bone or the spine or the kidneys, although those are movable. This is an example showing the left ventricle being used. It always lights up in PET. It's, it's, a, very, it's, a, it's a good thing to use when you're doing fusion in the chest. These are um, some data set challenges. Orientation, head versus feet first, prone versus spine, neck flexion is probably seen the most frequently, frog leg positioning, and always arms up versus arms down. Those are always challenging. The other challenges that you can have are the resolution. What if you have images that are coming in that are only 256 by 256? Those are really vague. Or you'll have a partial field of view. That happens often with MRI. And then, because um, the coils are only so big, you're not going to get a whole chunk of data out of MRI. Usually the data set's uh, smaller in dimension. And also the study length, soup to inf. So you might be short data where you're cut off exactly where you needed more information. That's where the study ends. Again, you see that in MRIs and spines a lot. So I have some um, examples of Eclipse registration tools. And this just shows an MRI um, CT. And you can see the chain up on top there where it shows that the CT is linked to the MR. That's the CT by itself. This is an illustration of what some of the tools are. And they're um, common in most registration systems. There's um, a checkerboard system. And there's a blend system where you can change the blending in and out. And then there's a spyglass system where you can look at just part of it. So this shows um, a CTMR registration before um, a match. I was going to do a point match to show you an example of that. And without matching anything up at all, the error it claims is 15.2 millimeters. And then after you do this uh, auto matching system that's in um, Eclipse at the time, they were doing points. And this shows the maximum error is 4 millimeters. So what are the elements of CT fusion? You need to understand exactly what the machine is doing when it fuses. It's going to take the largest, in mutual information algorithms, it's going to take the largest volume object, and which is almost always the outer surface of the data. When you know and anticipate that the outside of the patient isn't going to match, then you're going to want to cut that off if you can. Typically, when you do um, mutual information fusions, you have the ability to limit the fusion to your area of interest. It shouldn't be too small, but you can cut off the parts that you know for sure are not going to make it. Arms where there are no arms, things like that. You want to manually select to match the parent CT sim, you want to roughly match the sets before you initiate the mutual information. Or you're going to choose points that are really unique, space them far enough. You should have to have at least three, but you probably shouldn't have more than seven or eight. Uh, there's quality measurements in some of the systems. I know that Eclipse and Corvus um, used to be able to score and say how good you're making. So patient data orientation verification, how do you know which ends up? And yes, this is a question in sarcoma of the thigh. You, you will ask yourself this, which end is going to the knee and which end is going to the hip? Um, Pinnacle will ask the user to define the orientation of each data set. Eclipse will take the orientation off of the header from the machine. I'm not sure about CMS. I need to stress this, it should be in all bold, not just caps. The parent data set, the CT sim, needs to be orientated correctly on the workstation because whatever orientation was done that, this is on the, on the CT workstation, when the images were obtained, that orientation will follow and you will have inverted DRRs if you don't do that. You will have uh, inverted 
gantry angles. You have to have the correct orientation come from the CT. So let's prepare the data set for fusion. You got to label them. Almost all series come uh, labeled series 1, series 2, series 43. I would change the labels on those so that you can tell one from another pre-op, post-op, whether it's T1, T2. Um, what are the problems when you're preoperative versus postoperative? You're going to have a problem with the brain for midline shifting, edema, the burr holes and the little metal clamps that they put over them. The neck, you're going to see status post neck dissection, sometimes tracheostomies. In the abdomen and pelvis, you can, you know, if somebody's had a Whipple, you're missing a whole lot of person there um, when you're using a pre op scan. And then uh, certainly in the case of hysterectomy, there's entire organs missing. And in limbs, the muscle compartments are missing and there's scars and indentations. So you got to watch what you're doing pre -op. What are some common alignment challenges? What if you don't have um, any outer information? In the abdomen, the spine is your only reference, and you're turning everything around a very small axis, aren't you? The entire vertebral um, axis within the abdomen can only be five, six centimeters in diameter. That's not a whole lot of information, so you got to watch what you're doing there. Um, ribs are not a really reliable thing, but they're almost the only thing you have, but you need to be careful there. Your other alignment challenges are neck flexion, open mouth, chin angle, inspiration, expiration, the arms with or without, and partial data sets and how the limbs are positioned. So that's why we have deformable registration. And deformable registration is great. And there's some terrific tools, and that's not the topic of this particular talk, but I really encourage you to look things up. So the MIM um, system, and then there is the Ray Station system. And there is also the velocity system. And they all do deformable registration with different algorithms, and they can warp images. What are your goals, according to the RTOG? They feel that brain, optic nerves, brain stem, those are all best done with MRI. They say parotids in the submandibular glands, and anything in the oral cavity is MRI. The lungs and esophageal and nodal masses should be done with PET. And the prostate and the penile gland are again done with MRI. We're going to talk a little bit about respiratory gating. So long time ago, like three, four years ago, um, you would synchronize the radiation beam with the respiratory signal and that means you'd turn off the linear accelerator when you wanted it and on. And the tumor motion is assumed to be correlated with respiratory motion. But now we use respiratory motion management, and this is much more commonly used. You treat the patient while they're breathing, and you acquire the 10 phases, phases of breathing, and you develop an ITV, the integrated target volume, and the data acquired in the therapy are delivered with the patient breathing, and abdominal compression is typically used to limit the volume of inspiration. You should know that this is not done for just SBRT. It is also done commonly for deep breath hold left breast treatment. You'll hear D-I-B-H, deep inspiration breath hold, that kind of thing. That's going to bring up polling question number eight, please. Uh, next thing we're going to, I'm going to whip through just some um, data acquisition that shows a lot of the sinal curves that inspiration. It's done with radio uh, infrared camera detectors. You can do a patient feedback system sometimes. This one uh, doesn't even have a belt on. And here are some other solutions. Um, the um, ABC device and the deep inspiration breath and hold. There's a lot of problems with respiratory gating in that there is some residual motion within the gating window on the accelerator. Most of the time we're going to do 4D radiotherapy. That's done with those clips where the, beam will, the couch will actually move. So here's gating. The beam's on in the red circle and it's off in the yellow and it's back on. You can see the tumor moving in and out. And one of the things you get with this type of analysis is you can see the distortion specifically in the abdomen and in the chest. How 
shapes of objects change, not just their position, but shapes. And then there's 4D radiation therapy, and this was kind of a cute movie, I guess. This shows um, with gating, beam on, beam off, beam on, like a, we just showed you. But in 4D therapy, beams on, couch moved, couch moved, until the couch is actually moving during the treatment. Before we get to the next topic, we're going to do polling question number 11. In discussing the uncertainties in radiation therapy, you're going to have uncertainties in, in everything in life. But we need to understand uncertainties in order to take steps to keep them within, or at least to acknowledge where we're at. Here's the two major groups. You have dose uncertainty, because there's inhomogeneities that are moving in and out of beams. The dose calculation has a certain amount of uncertainty. And there's a variable in the machine's output. There's also uncertainties in the patient slash beam geometry. And that's immobilization, that's how the mechanical inaccuracies of, of the equipment, target determination was done subjectively. Sometimes patient changes their position. I'd like you to go to polling question number 12 now, please. Going on with the uncertainties, many of them are related to localization, positioning, weight loss or gain, tumor regression or growth, mechanical ones that we mentioned, and also the delivery and the dose calc. And now please proceed to polling question number 13. This slide illustrates the definitions established by ICRU 50. This is another important set of data for you to get your hand on as the ICRU reports. And these um, establish the definitions of GTV, CTV, and PTV. The addendum to um, ICRU 62 is, I'm sorry, it's the addendum to 50 and it's called number 62. Introduce the concept of planning organ at risk volume, a PRV. And to give you an example, um, you calculate dose to the spinal cord, but you also calculate the dose to the spinal cord plus 5 millimeters. That would be a PRV, so that allows for the motion of the organ at risk. I'd like you to proceed to polling question number 14, please. Among our last topics is treatment plan evaluation. The two most common methods are um, a visual review, and I, there's a great deal of value to that. Yes, there's subjectivity to it, but there's a lot of value to looking at the treatment plan. And then there's a numeric or, numeric or statistical evaluation with DVH. So not to leave uh, Washington U behind, they had a nice slide about that a 3D graphical display, a room view, there's 2D views of each plane, and then they describe the DVH and what it can do for you. So now what happens after the virtual sim, now we have the verification sim. And you put the patient on the table and you check everything. And um, I had a doctor who once told me she'd believe in virtual simulation when she had a virtual patient. They are real and they need to be verified and you need to make sure the gantry clears and that the imaging is correct. And this would also include the QA that's done on IMRT and everything else. I want to thank you for your attention. I appreciate um, your paying attention and answering the questions. Colorado is that beautiful. That's where I work. That's my clinic. And we have a little bit of time for 
Q&A that we can do during the chat. Another view of Colorado. And a last joke. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks again, Marissa, and thank you all for joining us for this free event hosted by WePast. For up-to-date information about future webinars, follow WePast on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Help us improve these webinars by taking this short survey.